I want to talk about something that's kind of different from most of my previous work. Um, I've done a lot of different things in bioinformatics, but this will not be a traditional bioinformatics talk. Um, my interests recently have turned towards information metrics as kind of a general approach to problem solving. And one aspect that I think is uh, a lot more interesting than the attention that is given to it, at least uh, right now, is uh, sort of the flip side of the data mining problem. That is to say, if uh, you think of data mining as being model selection where sort of the data stay fixed and we are varying uh, over model space to search for models that fit data, the flip side would be um, now the question of what data to collect becomes the variable. And um, you could view this either as an experiment planning problem um, or experiment design problem. This could range from very fine details of, you know, do we really need that control? Which uh, way of running this experiment will cost less money? To sort of the big questions of science about, well, you know, where should you point that telescope? Or should you be better off going to molecular biology now versus going into astronomy, et cetera? So um, sort of as a jumping off point here, um, you know, I think there's an interesting opportunity to try to turn the scientific method into math in the sense that we have a method that clearly works. But um, even for you know, the very uh, most brilliant practitioners of that scientific method, um, it is not necessarily the case that they themselves even can explain how they do what they do, at least in terms that you could program into a computer. So, um, you know, sort of the classic things that we've all learned about how to perform the scientific method in terms of proposed hypothesis, test hypothesis, these are really more prescriptions about goals rather than an actual um, specific methodology. So, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, the formulation of information metrics as sort of the basic guide for these sorts of decisions about where should we point the detector and exactly how should we tune details of an experiment design. Okay, we want to have a single general guide in the form of an information metric. The information metric is bigger value rather than smaller value, we prefer that experiment or that experiment design. And I'm also, to a certain extent, um, trying to follow a scientific methodology for doing this research in which effectively you know, we do computational experiments um, on a kind of a guinea pig problem that I'm going to introduce to you um, we call RoboMendel, basically um, imagining a robot shown the same initial observation that Gregor Mendel saw, namely that um, a pea plant, for example, was showing white flowers instead of the purple flowers that um, he's seen on uh, previous generations of, of pea plants. And then basically tasked with the problem of um, proposing experiments to start to figure out what's going on. Um, so in this way, we have uh, a guinea pig problem that, in effect, we propose an information metric, OK, can it pick interesting experiments? Is it miss uh, obvious cases where you know, a scientist would say, well, that's a better experiment than that? Um, in this way, we can quickly reveal the shortcomings in our thinking about these information metrics. So um, just to make a sort of obvious point here, um, Information theory has been around for a long time. Um, it's a very interesting, powerful methodology. Um, but in some ways, kind of a mismatch versus the uh, necessities and assumptions of, of science. That is to say, information theory, we take for granted that we have the complete joint uh, probability distribution of our relevant variables. Whereas in science, in effect, you know, that's sort of like the goal. We'd like to know what the complete set of um, interactions, causality um, in between 
all of the, these, these variables represented by their joint probability distribution. So um, the challenge here is in order to make information metrics that are useful for science, in a, in a sense we have to um, marry the power of information theory to um, the process of statistical inference that I think you could uh, formulate as kind of a basic description of how science is actually figuring out what the interactions between hidden variables are by means of uh, observable variables. And of course, um, probably for most people here, um, Bayes' law as kind of basic foundation for um, how this statistical inference is normally uh, done. Um, in effect, we're calculating posterior probabilities for hidden variables, which here I'm indicating with Greek letters, based upon observations, which here I'm indicating with uh, Roman letters. And in the usual way, this is computed from um, likelihood models of the probability of our observations given some assumed hidden uh, model and priors, prior probabilities of uh, various possible hidden models, and effectively in the denominator summing over a normalization over all possible hidden models. So um, what I'll try to do in walking through this, and I would love people to stop me with questions at any point if things, something's unclear or you know, wondering about something, uh, what, do I, what I mean. Um, want to go through various kinds of little puzzles that have motivated us in, in thinking about this work. So one basic problem, just to highlight sort of uh, difficulty from, from a Bayesian point of view, say we have two different experiments. Um, and one experiment favors one model. Um, another experiment favors the other model, by which I mean simply that, for example, um, the relative likelihood odds ratio for the experimental observations given model A versus model B in the first case um, favors model A, whereas in the second case favors model B. And from a really simplistic uh, Bayesian point of view, the one basic difficulty would be that you know, Bayes' law is going to compute a single posterior probability out of all of these observations. And inevitably what that's going to mean is that depending upon the relative sizes of the data sets of observations for experiment A versus experiment B, um, the numbers are not going to end up exactly on a posterior odds ratio of one. They're going to end up arbitrarily favoring either um, model A or model B, depending upon whether we have more evidence total um, coming from one experiment versus the other. So there's a kind of arbitrary uh, outcome from, from Bayes' law here. Um, whereas to a scientist, this situation where we have conflicting results from two different experiments that have been performed would actually suggest uncertainty, right, about which model we should actually believe. Yes? So what about the possible Well, uh, of course, um, any enumeration of the set of all possible models um, in practice, we're only going to look at some tiny subset of the possible models of, of the universe. So there's always, as you say, that additional possibility. Here I was simply talking in relative terms the odds ratio of those two models. But of course, that's not saying anything about the, there being the possibility of yet another model that would do even better than those two. Absolutely. So by any case, you're talking about essentially the information in the data. So it's not, it doesn't need Well, um, all I'm saying is that, um, let's say from the, the first experiment, there's some um, geometric mean uh, odds ratio, likelihood odds ratio for the observations of that experiment given either model A versus model B, and that uh, favors model A, okay? And um, so, you know, depending upon how large a sample size we have for that experiment, um, that product of uh, the odds ratios, you know, could be a big number, uh, and, and you know, we have 
the exact opposite situation for the other experiment. And you know, you multiply those two odds ratios arbitrarily depending upon sort of the relative size of the sample sizes. It's, multiply yeah. it's not just sample size, obviously. There's the, the strength of the evidence. That's yeah, right. absolutely. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure. OK, so um, the question that you asked about what is the possibility of yet another model that could be better than these two models, um, this is also a bit of a conundrum from the point of view of Bayes' law. You'll notice that I formulated that previous example in terms of odds ratio between just two models. Um, so you know, we all know Karl Popper's dictum that uh, scientific hypotheses, first and foremost, should be falsifiable, that we should have um, some kind of observational test that would reject the uh, hypothesis, or it's not a useful scientific hypothesis to advance. So the question is, under Bayes' law, how would you do that? Um, so this relates to the question that you asked in the following sense. Out of all of the possible models of the universe that we would use to try to explain uh, different experimental results, clearly we are only going to compute some tiny subset of them. And you could ask the question, how much of the total possible prediction power of um, all of the possible models does that tiny little subset capture? Another way of saying that is um, we're actually calculating that tiny subset here in the denominator as a proxy if you were going to actually try to calculate the posterior probability of a particular model. Um, what we're actually calculating in the denominator here is just a subset of the summation over the infinite set of all possible models, right? So is our actual number that we get out of that subset a close approximation to the true total, or is it you know, actually wildly wrong. And um, I just want to make the hopefully obvious point that Bayes' law in and of itself does not give an answer to that question, does not give a, a way for being able to answer that. So um, in, in a sense, uh, we have a conundrum, at least in, as far as using Bayes' law for scientific inference goes, that it doesn't have sort of an absolute line for, you know, the likelihood of your observations should be at least this good or, you know, <coughs> your model is far from being good enough and therefore we can reject the model. So how high of a value of the likelihood is, quote unquote, good enough? It's one of the questions I'll be addressing. Okay. So the overall uh, plan of the talk then is to focus on experiment planning to formulate some empirical information metrics for uh, recasting kind of the classic information measures of information theory in a framework of statistical inference, which basically means that you have to have a, a, a uh, number that is computed purely by sampling with a law of large numbers convergence guarantee that basically as the sample size increases, the information metric that you compute on that sample will be guaranteed to converge to uh, a classic uh, information theory uh, measure that uh, uh, would be computed from the hidden true joint distribution of the observation and uh, hidden variables. OK, so um, I'll be then applying these uh, empirical information metrics to questions like, how do we recognize um, what sets of observations are actually interesting from a scientific point of view, and also um, how to plan to find such interesting observations before you've even performed the experiment. OK. And the example that I'm going to be uh, spending a bit of time on, RoboMendel, uh, essentially you would, you would define that as simply being um, a selection of possible experiments or experiment designs simply based upon the information metrics that I'm going to be telling you about. Bigger information metric, better experiment. 
Um, of course, you can include cost and say, uh, I want to choose the experiment design that produces the most information yield per cost. Um, and then I'll go through some examples of how uh, the information metric that we come up with um, processes through proposing a series of possible experiments um, that basically lead to uh, identifying the basic uh, Mendelian inheritance principle. Okay. And the assumption uh, that simplifies Robo Mendel makes it kind of a nice example is that we basically assume Robo Mendel doesn't have any advanced technology, doesn't know any molecular biology. So, in effect, um, the only experiments that Robo Mendel can do are the ones that Gregor Mendel could do. In other words, possible crosses between different um, organisms. So, the set of all possible experiments is actually easily enumerable. We can just calculate information metrics across a panel of possible crosses and just choose the one that has the highest information metric. Okay. So um, if we have time, I will also talk about an application to a real scientific example um, from genomics, where um, actually on Monday I'll be talking about uh, this uh, methodology that, that we've developed, we refer to as phenotype sequencing for identifying the genetic causes of a phenotype directly from sequencing data alone. Um, but today, I will talk, if we have time, a bit about um, how we use the information metrics that, that we developed for basically uh, designing computational tools for optimizing uh, experiment designs for phenotype sequencing. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, um, there's kind of a bit of an incompatibility between the assumption in information theory that you already have the complete joint distribution versus the need to use statistical inference to infer that probability distribution in science. And uh, I'll just say very briefly that one thing that puzzled me for a long time in thinking about this, and which I feel has been sort of a, a, a crucial step for, for me in trying to formulate these information metrics uh, properly, is you know normally in statistical inference, we're focused on inferring probability distributions about hidden variables. We want to use our observables to make inferences about hidden variables. So it would be very natural, actually, to define our information metrics in terms of information yield about hidden variables, right? Um, so, you know, the first thing that you do is you define something like uh, just straight mutual information for your observable versus your hidden variable. And this is, you know, a useful approach for experiment design. I guess the one thing I would say about it, however, is that um, it is subjective in the sense that um, you have to have already chosen the right hidden variable. And then what the uh, metric tells you about is what experiment design details are best for getting at that hidden variable. But it doesn't, in any sense, uh, give you sort of the general um, ability to ask, well, what should we, what should we do research on? What should, where should we point our detectors in the broad sense? Um, because in effect, uh, this approach is, is limited to the situation where we pre-specify what our hidden variable target is. If you release that uh, limitation, then actually hidden information metrics um, are kind of completely unprotected against all sorts of arbitrary um, information yields where, you know, I can just immediately write down some random uh, model that I claim produces, you know, infinite information yield um, ba based upon, you know, some kind of arbitrary relation to uh, observables. So the problem is hidden variables and models exist in the mind of the beholder. Um, so they can be very, very arbitrary in their information yields. So um, the way I have actually defined this throughout the rest of the talk is in terms of overall prediction power measured strictly on observables. This can be a targeted information metric where you specify, I'm interested in the following kinds of observables like uh, heritable traits, 
it would be, for example, the goal for RoboMendel, if it's if a trait or some kind of random variation within uh, our data does not demonstrate inheritance from one generation to the next, then it's excluded from um, the metric. But apart from that, um, the definition is simply that um, we look at our average prediction power measured on some set of observables. And this could be just observables in general, or it could be targeted based upon something like, say, we want to look just at heritable variation. Okay. So um, in a form that must seem uh, very familiar because it relates to things like maximum likelihood and um, many other kinds of, of uh, basic strategies, um, our, our basic principle here is that um, we're looking at the sample mean of log likelihoods of some set of observations under some model uh, psi. And the main thing here is that we have a law of large numbers convergence guarantee that this will um, converge to the expectation value of the log likelihood of that observable random variable um, under the hidden unknown true probability distribution of the observable variable x. Okay? So the key problem here is we don't know that true hidden uh, distribution of, of x, um, which I'll just refer to as omega. But the key thing is, with, even without knowing omega, we can just use the law of large numbers to guarantee that we get an accurate measure of the log likelihood uh, of our observable under some chosen model sign. And we can define from that an absolute measure of our prediction power relative to the marginal distribution for x, which I'll just call p of x. And we call this the empirical information measure. Basically, it goes to 0 um, when our model uh, performs no better than the marginal distribution. So coming back to this question about what re represents good enough in um, uh, Bayesian modeling, we can define a potential information metric in the following way. In other words, if we were to imagine that we had the empirical information measured um, over the set of all possible models of the universe, so we, we would actually uh, identify the model that perfectly models our observations, um, and we subtract from that the actual uh, amount of prediction power that we're able to obtain with our current model, in other words, the empirical information, I'll just use that as the definition of the potential information. It represents the remainder, the amount of prediction power remaining as possible for this particular uh, observable relative to how much of that prediction power we've actually captured in our current model. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about this definition is that um, you can, again, obtain a law of large numbers uh, guaranteed estimator of the potential information um, without actually summing any more terms of the set of all possible models. Um, this is simply an empirical estimation procedure based upon sampling that has two components, one simply being this uh, estimator of the average log likelihood of our observables, which has a law of large numbers convergence guarantee, and second, um, an empirical estimator of the entropy of the observable itself, um, which again, you can get a law of large numbers convergence guarantee for. Um, there's lots of different uh, methods that people have for uh, empirical entropy estimation. Um, in the RoboMendel stuff, we're just using um, a simplistic um, k-nearest neighbors method that can scale to uh, multiple dimensions. I'm not going to talk about that at all. Um, typically, when you're calculating potential information measures on uh, data sets, um, what you're really interested in is the lower bound, confident lower bound of the potential information, which basically tells you, are we confident that this model sucks, right? In other words, 
We've got some model of our observable, and the question is, is it good enough? Good enough means potential information value of zero, or based upon the sample size that we have, that the lower bound estimator of the potential information is you know, negligibly larger than zero. If we can get a, a lower bound estimator for the potential information that's you know, some big number, large number of bits of, of information, that means there's a lot of prediction power remaining in that observable target that could really, basically, uh, we need a better model. Simplest way of saying it. So um, again, one can either use law of large numbers uh, to estimate the lower bound. There are better methods that we've developed based upon resampling, um, which uh, I'm not going to talk about today. But um, coming back to this example of, uh, yes, question. Sorry, I, I know you weren't, you said you weren't going to discuss it in detail, but maybe you could say something about it in words. But you, you talked about how the space of all possible theories is infinite and not terribly well defined. So you're, you're replacing that information with something else, with something about the observables. And right, okay. So the, so this is, I'm really glad you asked that question. So um, the basic difference here is instead of trying to compute lots of Mo additional models to see if we can get a better model. Um, in other words, searching model space, which, as you say, infinite. Um, this is a calculation that you do in observation space. So in effect, really what you're trying to do is you're trying to extract um, the empirical entropy of this observable. And typically that means that you're trying to estimate in an empirical way the density enough to be able to get an entropy value out of that. I so, no, 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 no. Just after the no, just just no, just the data set that we've got. Okay. Sample of, of points in observation space. We're just computing an empirical entropy on that uh, on the distribution that that uh, is implied by that set of points in space. Okay. So an, there are empirical entropy methods for estimating the entropy of just you know some sample of points in space. Right. So we use a simple, fairly simple one, but there are more sophisticated ones. Probably getting to this, so. But the computational complexity of it is you know just order n, where n is the number of points that you've actually got as as data points. So right. this is an easy calculation to do. Right. So I guess I'm hoping you can make this connection, but there are or order n squared. Maybe. Yeah. But there are the sort of the information theoretical. Okay. So okay. So right. So let me let me speak directly to that. Um, those components they use this term. Um, it is common in the data mining literature to refer to these as being like Kolbach-Weibler uh, relative entropies, um, and that is a statement that is perfectly fine if you are assuming that the observed data are held fixed, yes, right. and we're searching over model space. Right, so you're not doing that. that that's so, that's so the right. change here is, um, in, if you make that assumption, then the, all the numbers that you just referred to, which are based upon this estimator of log likelihood, um, they differ from the kolbach weibler relative entropy by some constant value. Okay. Okay, and the constant is just due to the fact that um, we're we're holding the observations constant. If, if we were a lot to allow the observable to vary, then um, the, that constant is just this. It's the actual entropy of the observable. Okay, so if you really want to measure, uh, the simplest way of saying it is the potential information is an empirical estimator of the hidden relative entropy of the observable relative to your current model. Okay. And you can show that it converges, and the resampling that, that he referred to, um, uh, we've tried a, a number of different ways of getting better lower bounds on this uh, potential information relative entropy estimator. And the resampling has proved, to me, the best. Um, 
it's a sort of like a, a bootstrapping type approach, re resampling with uh, replacement. Um, and if you're interested in that, I can give you a manuscript describing that. Are there other questions that people are wondering about? All right. So um, just to make the practical point about how this potential information changes the picture from just a straight Bayesian approach. So this is the, this problem that I was telling you about before when we have two experiments. One prefers model A and the other prefers model B. So depending upon whether you have you know, more observations for, for one experiment versus the other, either you'll get a gradual increase in um, the log odds ratio favoring model A versus favoring model B. It's just the point is from Bayesian point of view, it's sort of arbitrary which model you're going to end up preferring based upon whether you have more data coming from one uh, experiment versus the other. When you approach this same uh, set of experiments and models from a potential information point of view, um, again, the x-axis is just increasing sample size for these two experiments. Um, basically, what you get is a potential information measure for each experiment um, versus each model. And basically, what it shows you is that um, both experiments have strong potential information under at least one of the models. So instead of having some situation where the uh, Bayes law appears to be telling you, oh, we have strong posterior probability for this model, instead what it's telling you is um, we have strong potential information. These models do not fit these two experiments. No matter which model you choose, you end up with a strong potential information total. Is that also telling you that you should stop at the point? Yeah, so the error bars here are basically telling you that um, pretty much by around here we have enough um, data to know what the potential information value is accurately. We don't need any more data. OK. So um, the information uh, metric leads to an experiment planning metric in the following way. Empirical information, as I said, is a measure of improved prediction power. And uh, if we were to perform some experiment and it did not actually lead to a change in our predictions, then um, clearly this would have zero information value. In other words, if the prediction doesn't change, then zero information value. Because information here is being defined strictly as improved prediction power. If the prediction doesn't change, clearly there can be no improvement in prediction power. <coughs> Some data set of experimental observations, their total capacity to uh, improve our prediction power is simply measured by their total potential information. In other words, even before we ask the question, well, what's the right model for these observations? the maximum increase in, pretend, in prediction power that we could obtain by that best possible model is simply the potential information. In other words, you find the best model in the universe, all that does is it converts that amount of potential information into empirical information. Of course, before we do an experiment, we are uncertain about what its outcome is going to be, but we may have um, different possible scenarios, which um, under the hood, I guess you could call different competing models. I'll talk about that more in a moment. And some probability estimates for uh, how much probability we ascribe to those competing models. So you could imagine, and I'll mention this in a moment, that we have a total model that's sort of a mixture of competing models with different uh, probabilities. Now, we could then use this to calculate an expectation value for the total potential information for some specific experiment. In other words, there's a certain probability that one of these models is going to be the correct description for how that experiment is going to uh, turn out. And if it was, then we would get a certain potential information yield relative to our current model. So we can calculate um, an expectation value for the potential information even before we do an experiment. Hopefully, make an obvious point here that um, it, unless we allow the uh, probabilities for different competing models to have values intermediate between 0 and 1, there's sort of a conundrum. That is to say, if we think of the um, 
scientific method as basically you know binary either models false versus models true with with values zero versus one, um, then introducing some some model with um, probability one that could improve our prediction power, but doing any kind of experiment to test it couldn't, right? Because we've already accepted the model as being the prediction. So if we get a confirmation from our experiment, it's not going to change the prediction, zero information value. Um, and we've also ascribed uh, essentially zero probability to the possibility of rejection. So if we uh, introduce it with uh, a value of zero, then both the proposal and the experimental test would also have zero information value. So clearly, um, one way that we ought to be thinking about this is basically as a mixture of different competing models. Another way of saying this would be that despite the fact that um, in science we tend to think of what we're doing as testing um, quote unquote eternal laws that should either always be true or always not, the fact that we say, you know, design an experiment and maybe confirm our predictions, um, you do that one time, that doesn't say that it's an eternal law. Um, we still have a basic probability that you could think of as being sort of the mixture probability of that specific model for um, under different circumstances, different cases. I mean, you know, confirm Newton's law at 50 miles an hour versus confirming it near the speed of light, uh, get a different result. So um, long story short, um, we're making a transition here from sort of a basic Bayes uh, picture where we basically are uh, looking at um, the probability of a single model um, competing versus other models to a mixture model where um, I guess you could think of that as being um, we take multiple observations which could be of multiple animals from some mix of different species and then the current model at any time we would view as being what you might call posterior likelihood. That is to say, the probability of, of the next observation conditioned on all the previous observations, which are basically telling us what the mix is. Okay? So um, when we go forward to an experiment planning uh, decision, um, in effect what we're doing is we are uh, comparing the current mixture of models that we have versus what we would have after we performed some experiment. Some experiment might show that, well, what you actually get in this experimental case is you get a 100% uh, match against this particular model, whereas previously you only assigned it a 50% probability in the mix. Therefore, that's going to change the total prediction. That's going to yield improved prediction power. And that is expectation potential information. So this is the metric, expectation potential information. It's essentially um, a weighted average, if you will, of the potential information, which in this theoretical context is just the relative entropy of some specific model um, alpha versus what um, we have in our current model, which is essentially a mixture of um, different models alpha. And um, you can prove that this expectation potential information metric actually converges under the case where these probability estimates actually become accurate prior probabilities of the different models. In other words, the marginal probabilities of, of those different models. This metric will converge to the classic mutual information of our observable versus our hidden variable representing the different possible models. Okay? So um, it's an empirical information metric, but um, under the theoretical case where you actually have accurate um, prior probability estimates, it converges to a classic mutual information metric. Just to give you an intuitive feeling about that uh, perhaps surprising idea, remember this information metric is defined strictly on observables. There's nothing in this definition that even talks about hidden variables. So how can it converge to the mutual information um, of the observable versus uh, hidden variable? Well, the basic picture is as follows. Let's say that our current model, so-called posterior likelihood, is an equal mix of two competing models of our observable, let's say, uh, shown here down on the x-axis. So <coughs> under our current posterior likelihood mix, we either expect the observable to land somewhere here 
somewhere over here. Now, to calculate an expectation potential information metric, <coughs> we're going to um, perform an experiment that will actually observe x and either find that it's 100% of the time landing over here, as shown with this green peak, or perhaps 100% of the time landing over here. And then our current mix says, well, those two possible experimental outcomes each have equal uh, probability. So what we're going to be computing then is the relative entropy of this outcome versus our current mix uh, model. And you can see that what that's going to really turn out to is just going to be log of that odds ratio. As long as these peaks don't overlap, um, that's simply going to turn into a measure of uh, what this mix is. In other words, if it's a 50-50 mix, that's going to be a two-fold higher likelihood straight across this entire peak. So we're basically going to get log 2 out of this. Basically, this is going to be the classic one-bit uh, experiment. You have one bit of information under this expectation potential information measure. All right. So um, let's apply this to RoboMendel. The uh, initial model is simply that uh, RoboMendel knows a bunch of different species um, which are just treated as separate peaks in observation space. And each individual animal is considered to be an IID draw from one of those peaks. And I'm going to call that uh, model the like father, like son uh, model in the sense that our model of inheritance is simply that um, any child of two parents is going to be drawn from the same peak that the parents were drawn from, IID. And that um, interspecies crosses have not been observed to yield progeny. Okay? So that's the initial RoboMendel model. Now let's say RoboMendel looks out into his uh, pea field one year, and instead of seeing just purple flowers, he sees a white flower. Okay, so now this is the potential information uh, plot over here. So we just have probability of, uh, of the observable. Let's say this is some kind of optical density measure on the flower. The purple flowers are lining up over here, and white flowers are lining up over here. So we've got an observation over here, and that yields a small amount of potential information, which uh, motivates RoboMental to look more closely in that region of the field. And suddenly, he's seeing just white flower after white flower after white flower. And now he gets a big lower bound estimate for the potential information. If he tries to remodel the pea plant species by just saying, well, sometimes pea plants you know, have white flowers, um, then the prediction is that um, every plant is going to have some mix of purple and white flowers, um, just the way um, we say, let's say, in this field, we're seeing 90% uh, purple flowers and 10% white flowers. Um, again, we end up with strong potential information. For example, here I'm plotting um, two random flowers just drawn from any given plant. And the prediction then is that we should have mostly purple purple, some white white, and then some mix of white purple. Um, for our, our two-flower combo. And the difference, of course, that's yielding potential information is we are not seeing those uh, white and purple uh, flower pairs. What we're seeing is, on a given plant, white, 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 white. So this is either going to be an environmental effect or it's some kind of unprecedented inheritance <coughs> effect because like father, like son does not model this. No, no way to squish, get rid of the potential information under like father, like son. So our initial uncertainties that I'm, I'm using in these calculations, we are assuming that um, based upon many past observations of not seeing um, exceptions to this model, let's say we have 99.9% you know, confidence in like father, like son. Um, the possibility, for example, even that this phenomenon actually is a genetic phenomenon, in other words, that the WH or white trait is heritable, um, we're going to treat that as uncertain. It could be environmental, right? It could be maybe there's some chemical in the ground that that particular flower seed landed in, and so it ended up with white flowers. Who knows? So we'll treat that as uncertain. Um, even the question uh, th whether this is actually a member of the same species as our pea plant, based upon uh, where these seeds came from, we believe that it's a purple seed, but um, if it turns out that um, 
this is a heritable phenomenon. This conflicts with our whole uh, model of inheritance. So again, we'll treat that as uncertain. So um, the first set of empirical uh, information metrics is ex expectation potential information calculate on different possible experiments that we throw in silly things like let's cross a mouse and a lion um, versus cro different crosses, let's say, of WH versus WH or cross the PU or crosses a PU with itself and so on. Um, basically, the expectation potential information ascribes about half a bit of information value to this WH, WH cross, mainly because um, at this point, it doesn't even have confidence that this is a genetic phenomenon, but it has an experiment that can reliably test that uncertainty. And so it sees information value to doing that experiment. If you actually do that experiment, then you get actually get progeny with white flowers indicating that it is a genetic phenomenon. Based upon that, of course, all of the expectation potential information yields change, right? Because now the probability that WH is heritable has now been pushed up by, you know, if you do enough observations, it'll push it up towards one. So now uh, the question of whether WH is even the same species as our original purple uh, flowered pea plant becomes um, a experimentally interesting question because, um, again, we have substantial uncertainty about whether these are actually the same species or not, and we have an experiment that can reliably test that hypothesis, basically whether or not they're going to yield progeny or not when you do this cross. When you do the cross, it actually gets progeny, and they're all purple flowered, so um, the uncertainty about whether they're the same species or not basically can be pushed to near zero. Yes? So um, the, uh, the issue there is whether the gender yeah, of the, the contributor matters or not. The mom versus dad, I guess you could say. So to swap, which one is mom versus dad? In genetics, that's called the reciprocal. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so um, then we have the situation where purple seems to be winning out over WH when we do this cross. So um, one might propose, for example, that only one parent actually matters for, uh, for inheritance. Previously, we've always uh, made it things that looked the same, so that issue never arose. But now these sort of swap experiments where, let's say, previously we used uh, white pollen versus uh, purple flowers. Maybe now we'll use uh, purple pollen versus white flowers swap. Um, this, uh, we have uncertainty about this one parent model, and here we have an experiment that actually can test it. So this gets strong information value under the expectation potential information metric. This, again, yields progeny that are purple flowered, rejecting this uh, asymmetric inheritance model. And um, perhaps next, uh, Robo Mendel might come up with a what you might call signal or transmission model. That is to say that somehow or another, each parent is sending a signal to the child um, to be either WH, white, or, or purple. Um, so uh, this would imply that actually this uh, most recent product of white cross purple should be different from just straight purple. We'll call that uh, HY for hybrid. And um, this actually provides a, a nice test of the transmission model, because of course it's supposed to be different from purple. The question of whether it'll behave differently from the purple cross WH experiment that we've already done. So basically to test our uncertainty about the transmission versus um, like father, like son model. And we actually have an experiment that can test it. So these, both of these experiments get high information uh, expectation uh, yield. And if we actually do this ex experiment, um, it uh, will reject the like father, like son model in the sense that we won't uh, see something, obviously, that looks just like the parent. In fact, we'll um, get evidence that implies we have to have a hidden variable representing genotype um, that gets transmitted. So even if Robo Mendel didn't 
think of this so-called transmission model, it's interesting under the expectation potential information metric, um, it will still, for example, if it um, proposes, let's say, an purple undilutable model. In other words, imagine purple always beats WH no matter what. So um, you, could, you could think of this as being something like, well, you know, we've got one purple parent, we cross it against white, we end up with purple, we cross that against another white, we still get purple, we cross that against another white, we still get purple. That would, you could be thinking like taking one drop of purple and diluting it in an ocean of white and um, asserting that it will never dilute out. So um, again, we would have uncertainty about that and it seems to fit the previous observations better than like father, like son, but it has not yet been tested. It was just basically fitted to the previous observations. So then this would be something that would be tested by the next step of crossing um, what we've already done, one step of dilution of purple and white, we call that HY. We can do one more step of dilution with WH, and again, that will crack open this whole uh, transmission uh, model. Um, just to make another obvious point here, having thought of the signal model or transmission model immediately implies strong information yield for doing um, any kind of cross. Why? Because we've discovered one trait that behaves according to this transmission model. The question is, what is the probability that any trait obeys that model? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it 50 percent? We don't know. So the question is, if we just repeat, look at other traits, are they going to follow um, this or not, our current model ascribes strong uncertainty to that in the mixture. So consequently, it's going to give strong expectation potential information to any experiment that would bring up additional uh, possible traits. So basically, if there are any more uh, traits, uh, according to this model, they would be hidden within um, basically, uh, I guess what you would call heterozygous um, in the purple background. But according to this model, they should be revealed by simply doing the self-cross. So it describes strong information yield because um, this would be expected to flush out into the open any um, traits that would also follow this model. So the point being that the expectation potential information metric it's always leading to um, more experiments that would reveal more aspects of genetics. So basic conclusion that uh, I will end with here is that um, even very simplistic model assumptions that we've been using, um, the expectation potential information metric seems to do a pretty good job of guiding um, the experiment planning towards experiments that are actually productive and that actually um, flush out the basic principles more or less as, as Mendel did. Um, this appears to be a robust process. Um, clearly, uh, as I've tried to emphasize here, the information metric that you'll get in the next step of experiment planning is very much going to depend upon what models you propose. In other words, if Robo Mendel hadn't proposed the transmission model, the information metrics would have been different, right? Because it's only when you propose a model and you have uncertainty about it, then in the mix, that's going to lead to um, an expectation information uh, uh, for any experiment that could actually really resolve that uncertainty with a real experimental test. So uh, it's interesting to note that even if Robo Mendel had not thought of this transmission model, but come up with something, say, you know, wrong, um, that still actually gets driven back by the potential information metric towards the decisive experiments um, that would have led to flushing out the truth in the end. I also want to emphasize that um, the only thing that we have tested here is simply the experiment planning metric. There's absolutely nothing here in the way of automation of uh, model proposal. Okay. Clearly, if you wanted to have a robot scientist, you have to both automate uh, proposing of uh, models of 
the underlying data. It's more of a, a data mod mining or model selection problem. Um, uh, we've been focused instead on uh, the evaluation problem of experiment planning. Um, I'll also mention briefly in closing that um, all the details of our calculations and, and code are available for people who want to look into this in more detail. And there's also a manuscript with full details up uh, on, on my blog, uh, if you're interested. So given the time, I think I'll just end there with um, some acknowledgments. Um, this work has been done in collaboration with my postdoc, uh, Mark Harper, at UCLA. Um, a very talented uh, mathematician who um, has been working in evolutionary game theory uh, as part of uh, the UCLA DOA Institute for Genomics and Proteomics. Believe it or not, we actually um, do this work under uh, Department of Energy uh, bioenergy uh, funding um, because we've been using this uh, experiment planning metric actually for designing experiments for um, bioenergy phenotype uh, analysis. And I'll be talking more about that actually on uh, Monday about the, the phenotype sequencing work, which is more of a real application to um, genomics and, and microbial uh, phenotypes. So I'll just end there and thank you for uh, your attention. Mouse and lion, yeah. Line was next after the swab, which was surprising to me, that there, because there still is information left in the reciprocal frogs, in terms of because there'll be other forms of inheritance, right? Um, we'd but already done the cross or, as an earlier experiment. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, so that's, 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 that's right. why right. it's information that's 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 that. The other question I had is, you did tie this in very much into a Popperian framework, which of course is not the only framework for doing science. I mean, a lot of people, particularly in ecology and evolution, where I come from, think about. Bit. We tend to think that that's not equal way, and we tend to think of more of the Cosian predictive approaches can predict future observations right, right, right. rather than. Can well, I, I mean, I actually that that's kind of how I think about it too. Right. It looks like you started sort of moving towards. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. Right, right. Um, but so why even put that in the framework? Because that's sort of implicitly in your in your framework anyway. Let me see if I understand. So um, the idea of, of of the true rejection of. So, I mean, you started before you sort of made the adjustment with for, for the distribution of uh, the probability of the, the model. You started with the, the idea of the Popperian was falsifiability, i.e., that the probability of this model being a the right model, or at least, or being a wrong model. Well, okay, so, 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 so let me uh, say why, what the specific connection is. Yeah. Um, potential information, in my view, is the answer to how you reject a hypothesis um, using experimental data. So, you know, Bayes' law doesn't re really do that. It's always like you have to have yet an, another explicit model that you can show is better than this model. But you're always, you always, by definition, you always have some model that's like the best model, right? And so the question is, is that best model good enough? That's a potential information question. But that's actually, so I actually, we'll talk about this, I guess, later, but I actually reject that as the way Bayes Oh yeah, no, no. I, I'm in a complete agreement with that. The problem is, uh, we only sum over some tiny yes. portion of sure. model space. So the people who tend to be sort of most careful about this will say, you can never calculate anything except about a posterior odds ratio. Yes. You can't calculate a posterior probability. Okay. So, by definition, you know, in that mix, maybe there's some term that's kind of floating up to the top, right? And the question is, even the mix, is it good enough? Okay. That's a potential information question. So I'd like to go back to this lion mouse thing. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 
thought one of the uh, initial assumptions was that interspecies crosses didn't produce progeny. Right. So, so the the assumption was that um, Robo Mendel has observed that you know out of many possible interspecies crosses that no you know um, what do they say like uh, you know there's the song about uh, little Miss Mousy married Mr. Frog and is going to produce like frogs with fur or something like that we, you know Robo Mendel hasn't seen any frogs with fur hopping around so basically. The assumption is that, um, let's say, you know, some approximately a thousand uh, possible interspecies crosses have been failed to be observed that could have been observed. So we're ascribing some, you know, pretty small probability, like oh, okay. 0 0.001, so to the possibility of, of uh, successful progeny from interspecies crosses. It's some small number based upon experience. Okay, so okay, so that, that was the assumption, and so so the mouse cross lion gets really low because basically we've already ascribing really low probability to the progeny there. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking that that was like uh, an underlying like law that Mendel, that Robo Mendel. No, it's law. not. A, it's, it's, it's just thrown in there as being, you know, yet another thing that is sort of according to the posterior likelihoods in this sort of reached saturation in terms of, you know, failed to observe this, failed to observe this, failed to observe this. So. Don't try looking for that. All right, I think we'll thank our speaker. I do not remember the references now. Um, in the first day, I know it's cited.